my parents didn't like it at all. Especially my mom. She really thought I was rejecting my Polish heritage. Because remember, for my mom, it was not religion that really mattered. It is because Catholicism was part of her Polish identity, her cultural heritage. And she thought I was throwing this away. And I had to explain to her that absolutely not, you know. I consider that I'm just doing a software upgrade. I, you know, all the prophets we believe in, they're in Islam. Jesus, Moses, all the stories. We believe in the same thing. And if you look at the roots of Christianity, Judaism, if you read the Bible, if you read the Tanakh, you will see that all the rituals that are present in Islam were there from the beginning. You will see in the Bible prophets, when they pray, they do sijda. You will see that people would used to pay zakat. There was uh, the prohib prohibition of the meat of swine and intoxicants, a prohibition of usury. And even if you look at the prayers, people used to pray several times a day at fixed times. Uh, in some branches of Christianity, uh, including Catholicism, you had between seven and nine daily prayers. In Islam, we're lucky, it's only five. But my mom couldn't comprehend that. She, I would explain to her one day and the following morning, it was as if she had forgotten everything. My dad was a bit more cool with that. Uh, but one big surprise came from my grandmother on my mom's side. My grandmother was around 1991 at the time. And uh, she is this old lady who used to live in the countryside. My grandmother used to have uh, portraits of John Paul II uh, because the, the Pope John Paul II was Polish, so it was like a national pride. She would have pictures of uh, uh, Jesus, Mary, and the Czarna Matka. Uh, representation of Mary somehow as a black person and this is the na one of the national treasures of Poland and I wanted to you know tell her about uh, my recent journey that I embrace Islam and uh, and I so I told her you know that now I pray uh, five times a day I fast she made an allusion to, to my beard and she told me oh it's like Jesus on, on the pictures and to my wife who was wearing the hijab um, she said oh it's beautiful it's, it's, it's like Mary on the pictures because you know Mary in the in the pictures in Christianity always is depicted with a with a veil on, the, on her on her head this like was completely contrasting with the reaction my mom had as if you know because maybe she could relate to like me praying. We, we connected on, 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 on these facts. The next step obviously was to learn about the religion. And you know, when my friend who was managing the security company um, wanted to teach me, uh, show me about uh, Islam, what people do on a daily basis, he just brought me to the mosque and told me, pay attention to others and just do like everyone else. That's it. So I was in the mosque and just you know doing all these gestures not understanding what was happening at all. And that was it. That was Islam for me. Along the journey, I met a person who would become my now ex-wife. Um, I was 21, it was uh, 2008, and um, we were best friends at uni. I didn't even know she was Muslim uh, uh, at the time. Uh, she was uh, from Mauritius, she was born and raised there, and moved to France for her studies. And you know, in Mauritius, you never know, you have people who are um, Hindu, in the, you have people who are Muslim, Christian, you have a bit of, it's a, bit of a mix, I, I couldn't tell. I found out that she was Muslim and we really liked each other and decided to get married. We got married in Mauritius. I was literally living a dream. You know, now, nowadays, uh, people pay dozens of thousands of dollars or pounds to organize these destination weddings and me, the 21 year old me, we just like flew there, had a small wedding with a family and that's it, we were married. And I have to thank my ex-wife for how she taught me how to learn religion. She told me, do not follow anyone in particular, any school of thought. Uh, you have internet, 
you have the Quran, you have many different translations of the Quran freely available, you have all the hadith available on the internet. For the Quran, you have all the tafsirs, the interpretation of the verses freely available. And you have the context of revelation for each verse, and you have the sirah, the life of the of Prophet Muhammad. If you have any questions, do your research. If you listen to anyone, think of them as consultation. Because so many different scholars have different opinions on similar matters. And I think this is what saved me from veering into one path or another. And so far, I've never come across something, a principle I was disagreeing with. Every single thing in the region had a perfectly satisfying explanation for me. This is where I want you to drop the term convert or revert. Because sadly, these terms have a very, very negative baggage attached to them. So when you say to your parents that you're going to convert to Islam, they're going to think like my mom. They're going to, or oh, my kid is losing their heritage. They're renegating the culture, the family. Sadly, and I have a whole video about this, uh, the term a conversion has a very, very heavy heritage influenced by a Christian, Greek and Latin lens, which is absolutely not what the process of embracing um, a frame of reference such as Islam is. It's absolutely not, you know, that one like turning point, you forget the past and you only consider the future. I would like to say people have embraced Islam or when they're really, really fresh, they're new Muslims. And this is where I want to talk about what Islam is. You can watch the video I've made because that was one of the topics of my PhD. How do you define Islam uh, for the social sciences? Because it is not a religion. It is not a faith or a belief. It is much more than that because you've got philosophical, ethical, moral, um, spiritual, metaphysical, cultural elements attached to it. And what makes Islam is not only the texts, the beliefs, it's not only um, the, 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 the traditions that are attached to it. What builds Islam is, you know, it's an ecosystem. So my experience as a Muslim in France was wonderful. I literally found a family outside of my blood family. 2008, if you remember, it was a very tough time for French Muslims. The people I found were like this. The solidarity was amazing across cultures. Uh, if you volunteer for a uh, charity uh, like I did, you would meet people who are North African, Turkish, uh, West African, uh, South Asian. Uh, working together, you would find people who are Sunni, people who are Shia, and doing work together. It was a time where people were busy with work, studies, they had their own families, but still they made time to be, let's say, at a location three times a week to make meals for the homeless, or to help students at university, or, you know, create an alternative media. It was buzzing with ideas. It was a time where, just for virtue of you being Muslim, if you were struggling, you could just show up at the kebab shop uh, around the corner and say, uncle, I need a job. I'm desperate. Can you do something for me? And he will tell you, yeah, come in, come in. And uh, he'll pay you like under the table. But I felt no one was left alone. People who were struggling, but people were resilient. People had resources, you know, resourceful. People had no money. No contacts, not networks, but still would mobilize to make things happen. Fast forward to 2013. My wife, who uh, now ex-wife, who would wear the hijab, pray five times a day, do qiyam every, every night, uh, fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, it was an abusive marriage. It was physical, verbal, emotional. Um, there is several videos I've made uh, uh, about it. You can have the link in the description for more details, but I, it just broke my heart uh, because how a person who is so practicing would treat me and inflict so much harm to the person she's supposed to love. Um, and later on, she fell in love with someone else. Still, 
I got offered a job in the UK and I decided let's go to the UK and give us a fresh start. We moved and the deal was she's going to stay with her aunt in the UK while I've, I, I'm looking for a place for both of us. But once I found the place, she said, no, I'm staying. Uh, it's over. People in the UK rarely accepted me as a valid Muslim because of my Polish parents. Again, just like my parents didn't like uh, themselves immigrants, they didn't like uh, Arabs and black people and Muslims. I just realized that lots of Muslims in the UK have embraced the same anti-Eastern -Euro European narrative that the narrative which basically fueled Brexit. But that was a shock. How can you say you're Muslim and reject someone because of their background. I got rejected from Muslim charities because once they found that me praying five times a day was too much for a Muslim humanitarian charity. I, you know, these are things you cannot erase from your mind. Uh, you know, I got rejected from jobs and marriage because my parents are not Punjabi and they wanted like to work with people who are Punjabi. They, and you know, there's many, many other experiences, but I've realized that I don't tick any boxes. Is never going to be truly Muslim because he's got the wrong parents, the wrong job, uh, the wrong income, uh, the wrong clothes on him. Uh, the, 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 he's from the wrong social class. Uh, and you know, so many similar things happen to friends of mine in the UK who are black, who are white, but working class. Um, it is a country were, you know, rife with divisions. This is what I can say about this. The UK is also this country where, um, you know, you have these big humanitarian charities that take millions in zakat, but it's become almost too common for a scandal to erupt where they found out that uh, the zakat people were paying to the charity was diverted to the director's pocket to the CEO for him to buy a Porsche. In France, if people do bad stuff, they do some illegal activities, they're criminals, because you've got Muslims who deal drugs, and if people are involved in these kind of activities, never they're gonna say or show that, yeah, they're like ultra pious, that they're better Muslims than any anyone else, you know. I I've met people like that, and they're honest. They tell me, you know, I know what I'm doing is wrong, um, but, you know, I hope that I'm going to improve with time. I know I should go to the mosque, uh, and I know what I'm doing is bad, but I need to survive. In the UK, complete opposite. The UK is a country where if you do a drug dealing, if you do human trafficking, you're going to be guaranteed they're going to be on every single Muslim podcast and YouTube channel. In France, I was declining invitations for iftar because there were so many of them. In the UK... Despite working in a Muslim charity with Muslim colleagues, no one invited me. And no pe people don't invite each other for iftar. It's not in the culture. Priority is work and studies. It is a very individualistic country. It's not, you know, the um, uh, uh, South Asian culture. Nothing to do with it. North Africans who grew up, who are born in Britain, they embrace the same thing. I think it's a British culture thing. In France, people are much more social. You know, it's there's, it's in the culture to go to each other's houses, hang out together, have social time. So now I've stopped arguing. You know, if people don't consider me as a Muslim, you know, okay, think whatever you think. I'm just gonna, you know, pray on my own corner, do, like, do my own thing. I just don't bother with these people anymore. I've learned my lesson, and now, in the UK, when I see an event advertised for Muslims, I had to remind myself that, no, it's not gonna be like in France, where they mean actually for all Muslims. I had to rewire my brain to tell me that, no, they don't mean you, Will. They don't mean you. Otherwise, it's going to end badly like the previous times. If I have any recommendations for people who are new to the faith or who want to embrace Islam, I would say, first of all, stay away from harmful people. Stay away from people who do not nurture you and harm others. You cannot be there for God or for yourself if you find yourself in a harmful environment that is detrimental to your physical health, your mental health, and your well-being. So be very careful who you befriend. The second thing is, 
acquire knowledge. Now we have the internet and lots of free resources available. I mentioned lots of different translations, the context of Revelation, uh, the life of the prophet, and everything one needs to understand the religion is freely available. Make use of it. It's tough. It requires work. It requires time. But it will prevent you from falling to my next point, which is false advertisement. When people make you believe that things are part of the religion, but in fact are not. Just like, you know, this is something I touched in another video about spiritual abuse, um, because often people take advantage of newcomers to the faith and tell them, Yo, you know, uh, you shouldn't do that, or you should do that, because Islam said so without providing any references, but just for controlling them, taking advantage of them, like so many people did for me. Lots of people will tell you that Muslims are here for each other, that if you're alone, if your family rejects you, you will never find yourself alone in the Ummah. Well, that was true in France, but in the UK it's a different story. I've heard it at every ISOC, every fundraiser, every mosque, the same narrative, oh, the Ummah is like one body and no one can be left alone because otherwise all the body hurts and, 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 and so on and so on. But people lie. If you say that either you actually support new Muslims and meaning that you help them acquiring knowledge, you help them uh, finding work if they're in a financially difficult situation, you help them finding a spouse and a good one and you know, you help, you, you help them. Uh, New Muslims are, in the Qur'an, a rightful recipient of zakat. Take that in mind. So either you help new Muslims or you put a sign in front of your mosque, converts not welcome, new Muslims not welcome. I would have loved for people to be explicit about this because it would have avoided me so many misadventures. But don't be hypocritical, don't lie about your intentions. And the same, not everyone who says they are Muslim are Islamic. If your humanitarian charity, which has Muslim in, or Islamic in their name, exploit orphans, or if you divert zakat money to buy yourself a supercar, don't go around and pretend that you're some kind of saint what is Muslim in what you do? What you do? What is Islamic in what you, in your behavior? If you abuse children, but people like to cover up because you know uh, is that and uh, where what what all those people are gonna say? No, my God is a God of justice. If you think that it's lawful to steal people's zakat and buy yourself a supercar to abuse children and keep silent around these issues, well, we don't believe in the same God. We don't believe. We don't practice the same religion. My last piece of advice is build your own community. Don't rely on others. If you're a new Muslim, you're going to be an outsider. And there's very, very few places in the UK where you can find a nurturing community which accepts people from any background. One example I know personally is Rumi's Cave in London. And the second one is Cambridge Muslim College. It's the only two places I've been to in the UK which have are really, really inclusive and non-judgmental. Stick to people who align with your values. You will find probably that there's best frameworks for you, uh, that there is better system of belief, or maybe you're just not convinced believing in any way. And that's fine. That's your choice. No faith, no constraint in religion. Faith cannot be imposed. It's a matter between like you, your conscience, your soul, your heart, whatever. Nobody should force or convince uh, um, like anyone or anything. As Muslim, you know, there's a there's a, like many verses. We're only here to pass on the message. We deliver the message, and then people, you know, it's not in our hands. Whatever they do with the message, it's all about planting seeds. And there's a very like amazing saying in Islam: even if you find yourself and the day of judgment is upon you and you have like a sapling in your hand just plant it just plant it and for me that's a philosophy that you know resonates the most with who i am thanks for watching thank you very much for your attention god willing maybe until next time take care of each other